the bombshell new book on Donald Trump's White House making waves beyond Washington as the White House now moves to block publication of Michael Wolff's explosive tome. Hello to you. I'm John Scott. And I'm Melissa Francis. It's good to be back with you. Good to have you here. Glad Enjoy you, it. Glad you, we both made it in. On this. Right to the storm. Fire and fury inside the Trump White House paints a picture of a president who never expected to win the election in its former White House chief of strategist, Steve Bannon, ridicules President Trump and his family. The president said to be furious quickly fired back at the man who once ran his campaign. The White House statement saying when he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Steve had very little to do with our historic victory, which was delivered by the forgotten men and women of this country. Steve doesn't represent my base. He's only in it for himself. Kevin Cork is following the story from the White House. And Kevin, within 24 hours, Steve Bannon has also commented on the president. Yeah, we're actually going to share a bit of those comments in just a bit. But clearly, the White House is hoping to stop the publication of this book, Fire and Fury. But let's be honest, this is probably just a smoke screen, right? I mean, because make no mistake about it, uh, this would be wrought with peril, both in discovery and any deposition that might come out of it, uh, to say nothing of the fact that no federal judge is probably going to side with the, uh, the, the president's lawyers to try to stop publication of this book. A lot of material already out there. So I think this is more of a smoke screen than anything, but you know, that's what they're going to do. And by the way, this simply ratchets up the story the more they talk about how they don't want to see this book released. Does that make you want to go buy the book or at least find out what's in it? And speaking of, there's also the issue of Steve Bannon. His comments in that book. Let me share a cease and desist letter that the White House put out earlier today. The president's lawyers, that is, put out. Uh, all this is happening uh, because they are accusing him of violating the terms of his separation, including comments attributed to him in the book. Uh, comments that, by the way really run the gamut and it drew this response from the president let me just share part of his statement uh, steve was rarely in one-on-one -on -one meetings with me and only pretends to have in have had influence to fool a few people with no access and no clue whom he helped write phony books an obvious shot at his former chief strategist now for his part bannon despite this big controversy says he is still committed to the trump agenda don't worry, there will be no uh, daylight between the agenda, Donald Trump, and the uh, folks at Breitbart, and the, the show, and the website. The President, of the, United States, the President of the United States is a great man. You know I support him day in and day out, whether going through the country, giving the Trump miracle speech, or on the show, or on the website. So I don't think you have to worry about that. As for some of Bannon's more explosive comments, like, you know, describing the now infamous meeting at Trump Tower before he joined the campaign as treasonous and unpatriotic, well, at least one former White House staffer says it is something he should definitely reconsider. I don't know if it's true, but what I what I what I would suggest to people, because what goes on in the industry now is people just say whatever they say. Uh, let's go verify it. OK. Uh, at the end of the day, some of it may be true. Some of it may not be true. Uh, but I have to say this. If he did say it, he should get out there and walk it back. All this, of course, uh, Melissa, as there are even more excerpts out there. Again, the more they talk about it, the more it makes the cycle here in Washington, and the more we have to talk about it as well. It's going to be that kind of day. But I'll be here for you nonetheless. Yeah. In the snow. I mean, <laughs> Michael Wolf is a hired gun. When they saw him That's coming right. and going, they had to know whatever he writes is never flattering. It, Absolutely. And and listen, be, let's be real here. Anytime you have a writer around, you're expecting some things to come out. And sometimes you don't get exactly what you bargained no. for. No. And with him, never. I mean, it's, al it, it's always like this. Anyway, yeah. interesting stuff. Good fodder. Thank you, John. You bet. And now the president's lawyers are sending author Michael Wolf and his publisher a letter demanding that they stop publication of Fire and Fury. They also sent a letter to Steve Bannon claiming he violated a non-disclosure agreement by speaking to Wolf. For more on all of this, let's check in with Bob Cusack, The Hill's editor-in-chief. We've really got three primary players here. You've got the president, you've got Steve Bannon, but also Michael Wolff, whose stories have been, the accuracy of them, have been challenged in the past, Bob. No, that's right. And, and I think that's going to be continually, uh, there'd be some questions about this reporting. And then it's a question of, okay, what do you have on audio tape? And certainly we haven't seen Bannon dispute that he said these things. And this is, I mean, this, John, this is a, 
This is a Shakespearean soap opera. I mean, you have, uh, this is the biggest intra-party fight I think you've seen since uh, Obama versus Hillary Clinton in 2008. And somewhere Mitch McConnell is smiling because, remember, Bannon is going to go after Republican incumbents. This is more likely that Trump is going to side with Mitch McConnell on protecting Republican incumbents instead of rogue primary challengers. So uh, that's a big deal. The, the ramifications of this fight are enormous. And I know Bannon's saying he's going to play nice now, but but what about a month from now, especially if the president continues to go after him? Yeah. Um, interesting, too, that, you know, uh, Bannon says there were, or I'm sorry, that Michael Wolf says there were no ground rules for his time in the White House. And that's where he supposedly uh, picked up these stories. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the question of, of who he talked to, how often we don't have the visitor log. So so we don't know that. And that's that's why I think that the, the president is as far as this legal threat. I, I do think and agree that this is this is more of a PR move of going after it. The First Amendment gives a lot of rights on books, whether they're right or wrong. So um, I do think that they're going to have to pivot next week and get off this book because they're giving a yeah. lot of attention now. They've got to respond, but then they've got to move to their agenda. It's a big month for the, the Trump White. House. But if you want to sell a lot more books than you otherwise might have, isn't one method to, you know, try to shut down publication, go after the publisher with a cease and desist letter? Yes, exactly, exactly. Everyone wants to read it. It seems like the, the most salacious uh, stuff is out there, but we don't know for, for a fact. I've not read the whole book other than the excerpt. So uh, I think time will tell on this. But, uh, you know, with, with Trump having a very good December, I mean, the tax cut bill was, was his biggest victory. He wants to move that momentum into this year and fighting with Bannon, intra-party fights. That's what Democrats love, honestly. The... Um Bannon was in that, you know, radio thing that he did on Breitbart last night. He didn't sound particularly bitter toward the president. I mean, he sounded like a different guy who's the one portrayed in the book. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to see that now people on the right are going to be picking sides. Do you do you side with the president? Do you side with with Bannon? Matt Drudge of the Drudge Report yesterday tweeted that that Bannon is a schizophrenic, so he was siding with the president. Uh, so this is going to be who's on whose side. Now now Bannon has also said that he Breitbart is his weapon. Now will he use that weapon against the president? Last night he's indicating absolutely not, um, but that remains to be seen. Could Bannon eventually? try to portray the president as becoming part of the establishment. Remember, yeah. Bannon thought about reportedly running for president himself, and, and uh, he may try to grab that mantle of the heir to the Trump of 2016. But when Bannon says, as we heard in that clip, him you know, saying that there's no daylight between um, the president's policies and, and what he's going to be advocating at Breitbart, um, versus, uh, you know, your, your, your point that the Mitch McConnell's uh, slate of mainstream Republicans are going to be less challenged now by Breitbart. It just seems like um, this might have the net effect of, of sort of opening the arms of mainstream Republicans to the president. Yes, it, that, I think that's a good point, John. I, I do think that could happen, um, especially because a lot of the mainstream Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, are not fans of, of Breitbart. But remember, uh, of Bannon. But, but Bannon also, uh, reportedly in this book, has gone after members of uh, the president's family. And that's why the president yeah. issued that, that unusual statement. So is there daylight? I mean, let, John, what, what if there's a, a deal on the Dreamers? Uh, do you think that, that Bannon is, is not going to go after that deal later this month? Uh, I think he will. I don't think he's going to be invited for Thanksgiving at the White House anytime soon, though. Um, no, I don't think And so. certainly not Michael Wolf. Bob no. Cusack, we appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thanks, John. Now to a Fox News weather alert. A dangerous winter storm called a bomb cyclone. Certainly looks like that in that picture there. Now bearing down on the northeast, the forecast calling for whiteout conditions and winds as strong as 55 miles per hour. Senior meteorologist Janice Dean is in the Fox Extreme Weather Center. She's inside now. Janice, she took off the hat. <laughs> I had to redo my hair. Absolutely. Although I, it looked fabulous. I like that hat. I know the hat was great. The giant's hat. I mean, you know, I, Go, Eli. We love you. Yes. Um, you know what? The storm is going to be with us for a while. And I just got a report that all JFK uh, airlines have been suspended at JFK Airport because the winds are gusting anywhere from 50 to 60 miles per hour. So we're not surprised about that. And we were thinking around this time that the storm was going to wobble to the left 
and it did, and it brought us more big snowfall totals. But this is a storm, of course, that started in North Florida, went up towards coastal Georgia and the Carolinas, bringing uh, five inches of snow to the coastal Carolinas. I mean, pretty big deal for them. And now the bomb has exploded across the Atlantic, going over the warm waters of the Gulf Stream and rapidly intensifying. We call this a bomb, bombogenesis. And, and it's really at its peak right now, really a tremendous storm a meteorologically look speaking tons of snow with this in some cases one to three inches of snow an hour especially on eastern long island up towards uh cape cod in the islands so this is really the peak of the of the system we're going to see upwards of a foot or more, especially eastern Long Island and uh, eastern portions of New England. Uh, but you can see you, it's really tough to see out there. And that's why we have blizzard warnings in effect. People are urged to stay off the roadways. The kids are off of school uh, and non-essential folks need to be at home like so we can get those essentials on the roadways to help if we need be. The wind gusts in excess of 30, 40, even 50 miles per hour. Uh, visibility is poor. Blizzard warnings meaning that uh, we have a quarter of a mile or less of visibility and winds of 35 miles plus uh, for extended period of time uh, plus three hours. So that's what the criteria for a blizzard warning. We have that. There is a blizzard in effect. And Nantucket, the winds are gusting at 46 miles per hour. Earlier overnight tonight, we did see almost hurricane force winds along the coastline. So there's your snowfall forecast. We up those totals, okay? This is certainly a snow day for Eastern Long Island where we could see upwards of a foot of snow. Boston, upwards of a foot for you. Bangor, Maine, up to 18 inches. The one thing with the storm is it is a quick mover. It will be out of the way by this evening. However, the winds are still going to be blustery. It's still going to be difficult to get out there and travel. And, and as I mentioned, they have just suspended all of the flights at JFK Airport. Behind this, Melissa, the coldest air that we have seen so far. So my concern oh. is we're going to have power outages all along the coast, right? And when we are dealing with forecast lows below zero, like we're going to on Saturday, that's going to be really dangerous, perhaps deadly. So people need to know where their warming centers are. Certainly check on the elderly and your kids and your pets, and we'll make sure that everyone is warm and inside. For people that are watching this in other parts of the country, it has a really different feel to it. I mean, I was outside earlier today just coming in the building, and it's it's whipping around you. It's not like a normal snowfall that you know can be sort of delightful and no big hey, listen, deal. I mean, this is sort of attacking you as you walk across the it's street. It's a true blizzard. It is yeah. a true nor'easter and that's what we're experiencing yeah. and one of the strongest we have we have tracked okay. in some time we got to go thank you so much janice okay a fox news alert and republicans will control the virginia house of delegates after all this wow. is one of the weirdest elections you will ever see um, the recent election turned out to be a tie there was a recount and a legal battle and finally, they decided under Virginia law, they would flip a coin to decide whether the Democrat or the Republican won. That coin has just been flipped. I, I believe that's the secretary of state there that we see. But at any rate, um, they flipped the coin and it went to the Republican. Uh, it would have the, the, the state house was tied up to and including this tie election. And now. The State House of Delegates in Virginia will be controlled by Republicans as a result of this coin flip that took place just moments ago. All right, right after the New York Stock Exchange opened, the Dow reached another major milestone. President Trump is weighing in on that. Look at that, 25,000 plus. Mitt Romney wasn't shy when it came to criticizing Donald Trump. Now the former Republican presidential nominee might run for the Senate. Our next guest says the media portrays him in a much more positive light these days. If the president can get to compromise with, with Mitt Romney, he can compromise with pretty much anyone. A Fox News alert and another big milestone on Wall Street. The Dow hits 25,000 for the very first time and keeps on going. That's the 7,000 point mark reached and surpassed since the presidential election. President Trump, of course, tweeting about it just now. Dow just crashes through 25,000. Congrats. Big cuts in unnecessary regulations continuing. We will continue to keep an eye on the Dow, which is up more than 150 points right now. 
Mitt Romney is back, the former GOP nominee for president and Trump rival, now gearing up for a Senate run in Utah, it appears. Our next guest, Howard Kurtz, says Romney is getting better treatment by the press this time around. Obviously, a presidential candidate draws far tougher media scrutiny than someone running for a one of 100 Senate seats. And candidate Romney made more than a share of mistakes. But most of the media back then were wedded to a portrait of Romney as a wealthy 1950s sitcom dad who liked firing poor people. Now that he's poised to take on Donald Trump rather than running against President Barack Obama, Romney is getting a far warmer media reception. Mr. Kurtz, host of Media Buzz, joins us now from Washington, D.C. So Morning, it, Melissa. It, it, see, it seems like there's a lot of evidence for your argument so far. Well, there's sort of a strange new respect in the press for Mitt Romney. I mean, when you roll the tape back to 2012, not only was he portrayed as a very rich guy with a bunch of houses, one of which had a car elevator, there was binders full of women, there was him strapping the family dog to the roof of the car for vacation. I mean, the media, by and large, portrayed uh, Romney as an insensitive plutocrat and kind of a strange guy. But now that he's been a fierce critic, first of candidate Trump during the campaign, now of President Trump, and could well win the Utah Senate seat being vacated by Orrin Hatch, uh, he's being treated rather differently. He made it seem like a rich guy on the right could never win. Um, you know, early on, his career in private equity, you know, where he ran Bain Capital, which, you know, it, it, in addition to amassing a fortune for himself, he created a lot of jobs and he was never able to come out and sort of defend that and say, look, you know, we we got rid of waste. We put companies together, you know, net net. You could have quantified how many jobs he created. He never did that. President Trump came in and he was able to defend what was a less job creating record and sort of had the opposite luck with with, you know, the same sort of rich guy on the right portrait. How is he able to do it differently? Donald Trump was just a better candidate with a stronger personality and a more of an instinctive feel for communicating with the media. I mean, you're right. Romney got saddled with all the layoffs at the companies that his bank capital took over without being able to take credit for the positive parts of his record. But you can tell how excited the press is at the prospect of a Senator Romney being here in Washington and being a critic, potentially, of this president, uh, given the, uh, the tense relationship. CNN says uh, Romney could be a new champion of the Republican opposition and I love this MSNBC headline hatch retirement opens door to Trump nightmare well, I'm not quite sure even a senator Mitt Romney would be a nightmare for President Trump. yeah I mean that real quick I mean you make that point it might not be a nightmare Hey, you real quick. I mean, Romney is a conservative Republican. He will represent, if he wins, a conservative state in Utah. It will be in his interest to vote with the president on many, many policy issues, even if he does disagree with him on things and uses his voice uh, to point out when he thinks the president is acting badly. Yeah, interesting. All right, Howard Kurtz, thank you so much. Good to see you. Well, Japan's prime minister speaking out about North Korea, what he says the regime should do, and how Japan will pressure the North to stop its testing of long-range missiles. Japan promises to work with the U.S. and South Korea. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe speaking to reporters saying Japan will help its allies pressure North Korea to stop ramping up its nuclear weapons program. Greg Palcott is live in London following this story. Greg? Hi, John. Yeah, more on that tough talk coming from Japanese Prime Minister Abe in a moment. But let's get to a couple of breaking developments in the past couple of hours concerning uh, tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Fox News can now confirm that President Trump has agreed to a delay in joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises until after the Winter Olympics in South Korea are over. That has been requested by South Korea. North Korea in general opposes those drills. The U.S. had been a bit reticent to say yes. It was agreed to in a phone conversation, however, between South Korean President Moon and President Trump. Moon is now offering direct talks between North and South Korea. This after Kim Jong-un called for discussions about sending athletes to those Olympic Games. We understand now there's been more phone conversations across the border today, but still no commitment to those talks. However, 
President Trump in a tweet today claimed credit for them. And I quote, with all of the failed experts weighing in, does anybody really believe that talks and dialogue would be going on between North and South Korea right now? If I wasn't firm, strong, and willing to commit our total might against the North, fools, but talks are a good thing. Meanwhile, in Pyongyang, the masses were sent out in support of the message of Kim Jong-un this week. Yes, he was talking about make nice moves uh, towards South Korea, but again, he had threats against the U.S. and said 2018 would be spent building up an arsenal of, of nukes and missiles, something, yes, the Japanese Prime Minister Abe spoke out today uh, against, saying that the uh, nuclear program could not be accepted, that Japan would build up its defenses, and that the security situation there was as bad as it has been since World War II. Back to you, John. Yeah, scary stuff. Greg Palcott, Greg, thank you. It's a bomb cyclone of a snowstorm now slamming the northeast with snow and ice. An up-close look at why this particular storm is so dangerous. Plus, can the White House bring Democrats to the table on immigration reform? What an agreement on DACA and border security could look like. We'd like to make uh, a deal on securing funding for the border wall, as well as ending chain migration, ending the visa lottery program, interior enforcement. So we'd like to do that right away. A dangerous winter storm called a bomb cyclone is pummeling New England after making its way through the southeast, bringing extremely rare snow to parts of Florida and Georgia. Never seen snow. This is the first time. I never experienced anything like this. I don't really even know how to drive on the road like this. It's reporting live from Ronkonkoma, New York, where folks are a little more used to the snowstorms, huh, Laura? Hi, Melissa. Well, I'll tell you what, the people of Long Island are certainly a hardy breed. I live out here. I can attest to that. However, even this winter storm has given us such a wall about here. It has really kept people away. We are at the Long Island Railroad Ronkonkoma Station. This is a major, huge hub where you usually see a ton of people. Rob, if you can, is going to pan over really quick just to show you. This is what it's looked like all day. We've been out here since 3 a.m., and this is usually a very busy platform full of people. Not today. Everybody is heeding that warning that was given uh, just uh, overnight and uh, really over the last few days, saying if you don't have to be out there, you know, really be careful. It is a difficult and dangerous situation on this commute. Uh, we were just out on the roads moving our cars around a little bit. It is a total whiteout condition situation right now. The snow is coming in strong. It is coming in sideways. And with such force, it feels like you are getting hit in the face with icicles. Andrew, Governor, I'm sorry, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo has just declared a state of emergency for three major areas, New York City, Westchester, and Long Island, and said if you don't have to be in, out in this, then don't. We have done uh, everything that we can do uh, in terms of preparing for the storm. This is not our first rodeo. The storms have been getting worse. Extreme weather is a reality. We're seeing storms of a severity that we've never seen before. We have made significant changes over the years. And as the frigid cold continues to bear down and snow as well on the Northeast, many travelers hoping to get out on a flight are finding out that they are facing major challenges today. Listen. All of the region's airports, the JFK, LaGuardia, and Newark are open, but they are operating at uh, highly restricted uh, flight capacity. Uh, but there are very, very significant flight cancellations. Two-thirds of all flights across the three airports have been canceled. And we have just learned that all flights right now at JFK have been suspended. And you can see why the wind is just absolutely wicked. It's pushing people around out here. And we'll continue to bring you updates as we get them. Listening to Janice Dean, hoping this thing is going to go as fast as they said it would. <laughs> Laura Engel bra braving the wind in Ronkonkoma, New York. Get back inside. Thank yeah. you. She's been out there <laughs> since 3 a.m. Let the woman come Our inside. Our priorities on what we would hope to have in any immigration bill and any DACA deal uh, haven't changed. They would include um, securing the border with a wall, ensuring interior enforcement, eliminating the visa lottery program, and ending chain migration. All those things are still the same.
The Trump administration aiming to tackle what it calls responsible immigration reform. Right now, President Trump is hosting a meeting on the topic with a group of Republican senators. But the GOP will have to reach across the aisle to get anything passed. Democrats are insisting on a fix for the so-called DACA program. Uh, the White House says that will not happen without funding for the border wall. Let's bring in Isaac Wright, a Democratic strategist and partner at Forward Solution Strategy Group, and Mark Lauder, former special assistant to President Trump and press secretary to Vice President Mike Pence. Thanks, both of you, for being here. Thank you. Good to be Isaac, here. Isaac, what about, what about just a pure trade? You know, we, we, we fix DACA, we allow the so-called dreamers to stay, and uh, you build a border wall. What's, what's wrong with that idea? Well, I think that's what Democrats have pushed for, is a fix to DACA. There's yeah, been but, a failure but, but of leadership from the them, White House. And Isaac, I'm President sorry, many, Trump many of them have said, no, no wall, no way. Well, I think what we're waiting on is President Trump promised that Mexico would pay for the wall. It wouldn't add to the trillion dollars to the deficit that Republicans just added with the tax bill. So I think we need to see that check come through. Mark, what about it? Well, what we have to have are Democrats who are going to offer to actually compromise with something other than more resistance. The president's been very clear on this. The American people want stronger border security, an end to chain migration, an end to the visa lottery program. The president, they have a partner in the president who wants to deal with the uh, DACA issue, but Democrats are going to have to offer something uh, and, and able to reach an agreement. We're just not going to do an amnesty deal uh, just to get a deal done. It, it is but true. The president created the DACA issue by rescinding what we had up until his election. So well, that was what, already what, an illegal, that was an illegal program that, was, that had already been declared illegal by the courts and it was going to go away. Yeah, so. you, you could say that President Obama created it. I mean, it's in the name deferred action. Uh, nobody in Washington wanted to deal with this mess. It, w it was it was working until Trump deferred it back to Congress and said, OK, we're scrapping the plan as it exists from the Obama administration that was working. We're right now looking at losing four hundred and sixty billion dollars in economic activity over the next decade from the loss of eight hundred thousand dreamers that are about to be deported. Seven hundred and sixty thousand who have jobs right now will lose those jobs. That's going to cost employers, according to the Joint Economic Committee of the U.S. Senate, six point three billion dollars for every Everything that Republicans have done to the economy so far with the, uh, talk about the deficit, so far with the long term of the tax bill, here are all these other losses we're talking about, economic losses and business losses, is to Main Street America that we're facing. Uh, Why not come to the table with Democrats and find a solution? Right now, Durbin is working with Graham because of the failed White House leadership. There are Democrats and Republicans in the U.S. Senate who have broken off from that, who are preparing to offer their own bipartisan solution bill. Can the White House get behind that? Well, M Mark, I guess, but one of the, we go back to, you know, we're kind of going in circles here, but we go back to the thing that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, obviously, this president campaigned on the idea of a wall, building a wall along the southern border, uh, was elected on that regard. And I think if if that's what his if, if that's what those who elected him want, why not? Why should he not push for that as part of these negotiations? Absolutely. The American people spoke. They want tougher border security. And I know this might come as a shock to the Obama administration, but Congress actually makes the laws. And that's why the DACA program was never illegal in the first place, because it was done uh, without the approval of Congress. It was blatantly illegal. So let's get together. Let's work on a deal. Hey, if, if you can get something done on the Dreamers, if you can get something done on border security and chain migration, the lottery visa program, we can have a deal. A deal can be done. We just need Democrats willing to come Come to the table to work with this president to be able to deliver for the American people. President right. President Trump promised the American people that the wall would not cost American taxpayers a dime, that Mexico would pay for it. We're waiting to hear how his negotiations are going on that front. All right, we a lot of negotiating to be done. Uh, Isaac Wright, Isaac Wright, Mark Lauder, gentlemen, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. President Trump expressing support for the protesters in Iran, where the latest demonstrations could give Trump an advantage on the nuclear deal. Plus, a man is apprehended after his wife is found murdered. While news about his missing children has police breathing a sigh of relief. So you can imagine that uh, how excited we are to the fact that uh, Terry Miles was taken into custody in Colorado and uh, Lily and Lulu were, uh, were found safe.
Texas police breathing a huge sigh of relief now after apprehending suspect Terry Miles and finding his two missing children safe and sound in Colorado. Their mother, though, was found dead. The two girls had gone missing. Police issued Amber Alerts in both Texas and Colorado. The police chief made finding those girls his top priority. Many, many hours uh, went into uh, ensuring that these girls were, were found safe. And like I said earlier, our whole goal was to, to bring these, uh, to these two sisters home. Miles was the roommate of the girl's dead mother. Police calling the woman's death suspicious. According to police, Miles' criminal history is extensive. They plan to interview both Miles and those two girls. Deadly protest in cities across Iran putting more pressure on President Trump to decide what to do about the Iran nuclear deal reached during the Obama administration, a deal he has often threatened to tear up. The State Department spokesperson says concerns continue to grow. They expected to get something out of the Iran nuclear deal. The leaders there of that country promised that that money would benefit all the citizens. But yet we have seen Iran take that money and funnel it into the Houthi rebels in, uh, in Yemen. We've seen them send, spend money in Syria. We've seen them outfit Hezbollah. They're not spending their money on their own people. That is a concern of ours. Joining me now is Michael O'Hanlon, Director of Foreign Policy Research at the Brookings Institute. Um, you, you know, on top of what Heather Nauer just said, lifting the sanctions was supposed to win the hearts and minds of the people in Iran with iPhones and with Coca-Cola. Instead, the price of eggs are up 50 percent in the past year. What happened? Yeah, it's a great question. First of all, uh, what's happened, of course, is that Iran's economy has been poor for a long time, partly because, as you said, or as the, as the State Department spokeswoman said, uh, they di divert funds to places they shouldn't. It's also a system of government that's not set up to be efficient. It has this theocracy on top ruling things. There's a lot of corruption, a lot of inefficiency. And so a quick injection of funds isn't necessarily going to solve these fundamental problems. But, you know, I think there may be an opportunity here in the sense that we've all known President Trump doesn't like the Iran nuclear deal, wants to push back hard against Iran and its broader behavior. And yet it's hard to just rip up the deal. You know, if we do that, we could be cutting off our own nose to spite our face because the rest of the world will blame us for the deal's mm. demise. So maybe President Trump's better off pushing hard on these kinds of issues like freedom, uh, politics, you know, Iran's regional behavior, pushing harder and harder, developing better policies to support reformers, to support our allies in the broader Middle East, but, while he leaves the nuclear deal alone. But mm -hmm. he can still claim the opportunity here, or claim yeah. to have really pushed hard against Iran's government. So it, that's what I'm sort of hoping may happen. It is a different opportunity. Back in 2009, there were about three million protesters. They were largely the elites in the city. This is about younger people out in the suburbs, even though they are smaller in number. The problem is, though, if there is a regime change, or they do push back on those in power, then what? Then who's in charge? How do we know it's not going to be worse? Well, I don't think it's very likely there'll be regime change. This is not like the Shah in 1979, where it was sort of a very weak, brittle government on top and, uh, you know, a leader who had lost a lot of legitimacy with his own people. In this case, even though the government doesn't have much legitimacy with its own people, it's sort of a police state. And very well-developed, strong, deep police states don't usually lose their grip on power because of popular uprising. You never know, of course. I'm not yeah. trying to say it's impossible. But what I'm really hoping for here is a path towards greater reform and also a, a path towards greater empowerment of the elected president. We know that President Rouhani, uh, who was elected and reelected in recent years, uh, I think, you know, he, he's not our cup of tea exactly, but he's a lot better than the Ayatollahs over the years and the Quds Force and the people who are promoting unrest throughout the broader Middle East and the Iranian security forces. So we want to see that kind of part of the Iranian government more empowered. I and wanna, I'm hopeful that you, if the theocracy, the yeah. hardline parts, if they feel nervous, that they'll okay. allow more of that to happen. I want to turn you to North Korea before we run out of time, because yesterday all the talk was about my button is bigger than your button. Some people thought that maybe this was a case of good cop versus bad cop with the president versus the talks that are going on between North and South Korea. The president, in fact, is tweeting, um, failed experts weighing in. Does anybody really believe 
that talks and dialogue would be going on between North and South Korea right now if I wasn't firm, strong, and willing to commit our total might against the North. Fools, but talks are a good thing. What do you think? Well, I'm not going to necessarily quarrel with President Trump. I don't really think that he deserves primary credit for where we are, but if he wants to take credit, fine. The point is we're not really at any kind of a stable outcome. We haven't really reached any kind of a deal, any kind of a meaningful pullback from the crisis. We just see the glimmers of a little bit of hopefulness. So sure, give him the credit for that, but now we've got to deliver. Now we've got to figure out how to take the next steps. Uh, a colleague of mine here, Bob Einhorn, and I have written how we can try to take this potential thaw between now and the Olympics and build on it into a negotiation process, even as we also keep the pressure on North Korea. Well, what needs That's going to gonna be the trick. So I, I hope President Trump will want to continue with that. Yeah, what, ha what has to happen next in order to get to that point? Well, the North Koreans have to stop testing weapons, especially big missiles and nuclear weapons. Uh, we can delay our exercises and maybe slightly scale back their size once they resume, as long as the North Koreans know we're not going to in any way reduce our overall military preparedness. Mm -hmm. And those are the two basic things going in. And then I believe you have to go for an interim deal, a freeze on North Korea's nuclear and missile testing and production of new capability. I think that's the kind of deal we should try to negotiate. Yeah. If we delude ourselves into thinking we can completely denuclearize them in the first instance, I don't think there can be a deal. So I think we're going to have to go for an interim provisional deal without giving them too much in the meantime along and the way. The but that's got to be, I think, the goal yeah. once the talks get going, uh, whenever they do. Michael O'Hanlon, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, a change in policy on marijuana could be coming to several states. Fox News has